Long-time uh, viewers and subscribers of the channel may notice a not-too-subtle change in the decor of the cabin. Uh, this is in uh, preparation for where we're going to go with the history of camping gear after we finish with the World War II segment. This video is part of the World War II segment in the history of gear. But we'll be talking about each one of these packs and a whole bunch of other stuff in the post-war period. Now, before we get into the video proper, let me do my commercial. If at any time uh, you find this video entertaining or informative, uh, please subscribe to the channel, like the video, and when you subscribe, hit that notification button so that you can see uh, new videos as they come out. When you do that, it tells YouTube that you like the video and it looks at what you like and recommends the video to other people who might be looking for the same stuff you're looking for, for the same stuff you and I are interested in, the history of camping gear. Okay, If you want to go further than that in supporting the channel, uh, you can go to my store. There's a link down below and a uh, link in the comment section to the store. It's full of all sorts of neat uh, classic camping, historic camping, tchotchkes, and falderal. Uh, you can also go there. There's a direct link to my book uh, on uh, collecting Kelty backpacks. You might be able to tell how old this pack is if you have my book. Uh, and also you can become a member of the channel. There are direct, direct links in the comments to my book, to my store, and becoming a member of the channel. Please do. It really does help. There's a couple of things I'm looking to get to up the production value of this channel and help with the research. Okay? Alrighty. Let's get into the meat of the matter. Thanks for bearing with me. Okay, we're going to be talking about sleeping bags here, the sleeping bags in World War II. Now, first off, just like with, with all the other stuff that we're doing from, from the Second World War, I'm going to tell you, number one, this is not a military history channel. We're not going to get too much into the his, military history of World War II. And we're not going to geek out about the military aspects, the military collecting aspects of, of these things. Well, we're going to be talking about the developments of sleeping bags in the Second World War as it affects the post-war camping, civilian camping world. Okay, believe it or not, most of the research and development for sleeping bags uh, during World War II had more to do with airplanes than it did with ground troops. In order to understand that, we have to look at the uh, post office. Uh, after World War I, the post office started airmail routes. And for a few years, they owned all the airplanes, they employed all the pilots. This became a bit unmanageable, so they started contracting out to, to civilian companies, both large and small. Now, some of these smaller companies, in order to make a buck, started abusing the system. Uh, what they did was this, uh, they generated their own junk mail and then put it on their airplanes. Getting too much into the weeds on that, but that's what happened. And in 1930, the Postmaster General asked for uh, Congress to grant him authority to fix this. And Congress said, well, yeah. We'll give you the authority. I mean, giving giving the authority to uh, decide 
who gets the contracts and who doesn't to an unelected bureaucrat who is also a political appointee always works, right? Yeah, well, by the end of 1933, the inevitable corruption was exposed. And uh, uh, Roosevelt, who was president at that time, suspended civilian operation of the postal routes, the airmail routes. And to demonstrate how good the government would be at that job, they gave it to the Army. Because we all know that the government does a better job at doing things than the private sector does. Because the private sector abuses the rules, don't you know? Well, after about a year and the Army's deaths to air crashes increasing 15% and the resulting public outcry from that, particularly because they were only able to complete less than 66% of their flights to deliver the mail on time, well, then they decided, okay, let's give it back to the private sector, but let's change the rules so they can't be abused. Okay? So even though the Air Corps was uh, pretty embarrassed by the uh, experience and, and a number of people died because of it, uh, they did learn a valuable lesson. Uh, the 35 or so percent of incomplete flights were generally due to inclement weather and sometimes forced landings uh, in like farmers' fields and things like that. And, and in these cases, the pilot would be stranded either at a remote airport or in the middle of a farmer's field, and he needed to have some kind of way of shelter. At the same time, the Army was expanding its mission to coastal patrol, and a good portion of that coastal patrol, patrol flying out past the coast to look for bad guys in the ocean, uh, a lot of that was in the Pacific Northwest and the upper New England coast, where sometimes it gets cold. And they were expanding uh, a aviation operations in Alaska. So they knew that pilots were going to be flying over mountainous terrain, and sometimes operating in winter or arctic conditions. And they needed a way, in the event of a forced landing, to keep the pilot, even though he lands the plane perfectly, to keep him from dying from hypothermia. Now in order to achieve that end, uh, the military adopted uh, designs based on what was at that time considered to be the best sleeping bag for arctic conditions and that was uh, the polar and arctic sleeping robes as made by Grant Holden and Graham and the Woods Company, both of which we've talked about here in previous uh, episodes of the history of camping gear. You can go back and look at them if you would like. In fact, I encourage you to. Uh, but the military realized, same way backpackers do, that uh, if you want to go further, with the same gross weight, you reduce the bulk of what's inside your airplanes. And that's important because number one, the Army knew that they were going to have to travel longer distances than they had before. And they were going to have to carry a lot of cargo uh, in their airplanes that they didn't have to before. So they started looking at a way to reduce the weight and bulk of the sleeping bags, just like you would if you were, if you had uh, some some old baggy, you know, some some Walmart sleeping bag, and you wanted to reduce your weight and bulk, and you start looking at some nice cottage manufacturers' uh, down bags, which is what the army did. They started looking at down bags. They had already adopted Eddie Bauer's down jackets and trousers for flight suits. And they started looking at down for sleeping bags. Now, they tried a number of designs, which we're not going to get into, because they all turned out to be dead ends. But what did succeed was something that I showed in my video, 1928, the year that everything changed. And it ended with a segment like this. Now, 
Now, we also know that if we look at our video on Omi is a name you should know, the Omi Diver had patented a way of making sleeping bags and even better. And that was to provide that step inside the sleeping bag that separated the inner, uh, the outer layer from the inner layer, thus giving you more space to fill down and no stitching that allowed cold air through. Okay, so now we have the insulation we need. Goose down. Been around for about 50, 60 years. The Army is already using goose down. But in a design that required much more of it and constructed in such a manner that you also need to have wool blankets incorporated in the design in order to get the down to perform at its peak. Okay? Eddie Bauer shows them, well, if you quilt it, it works better. And then we have Omi Diver improving on that as far as sleeping bags are concerned by providing that little fabric step in between the outer layer and the inner layer. Thus, have coming up with a sleeping bag that doesn't allow cold air to come through the stitching. You don't need the wool bag anymore. You don't need the wool. At the same time, the Army is developing a sleeping bag for the 10th Mountain Division. There that is again. There's the 10th Mountain Division again. You might think that they were important in the development of camping equipment, wouldn't you? many times as we're talking about it. And they realize that if you take the combination of the uh, step design, you will be able to come up with a lighter sleeping bag. But, because Eddie De Bauer had designed down-filled flight suits and they were performing so well, Goose Down became a strategic material. That meant only the military could buy goose down. Nobody else could. Okay? And they had to maximize its use because, uh, practically speaking, you have more need for flight suits than you do for emergency sleeping bags in the Air Corps. And you've only got one division, one Army division, that is going to need mountain sleeping bags. Eddie Bauer to the rescue again. He suggests that, okay, you've got a nice design here and it works for mountain conditions, but you don't really need as much down as you think you do because you can mix duck feathers in with it and thus reduce the need for down. It increases the weight a little bit. That was what the Army adopted for the uh, 1942 Mountain Sleeping Bag. Okay, and it's a mummy bag, just like the one you use today. The principal difference between the World War II Mountain Mummy Bag, Mountain Sleeping Bag, is that the opening only goes down about to your belly button. Okay, they call them suicide bags. Because if you went to sleep in it and the enemy attacked, it would take you too long to get out before the enemy shot you right twixt the peepers. Uh, that was improved in 1949 to have a full length zipper, and that is why today your mummy bag only uh, zips down uh, the full length. So if the enemy attacks you while you're camping on the trail, you can get out of your bag real quick. And then Eddie Bauer says, you know, You've already got a good bag there, but you need a bag for Arctic conditions. Well, rather than make two different bags, let's use this mountain bag that you've got, and let's make a bag that is completely filled with down for use in Arctic conditions so that your, your pilots who are flying over the Himalayas or up in Alaska have something they can use. And they came out with the uh, World War II Arctic sleeping bag. And the way that worked was it was a down-filled bag, but 
in order to use it at its most potential, you took the mountain sleeping bag and you stuck it inside. Now, that's a design some people use today. I use that uh, myself with my my hammock uh, underquilt. I have I have an underquilt made out of two pieces. If, if it's going to be real cold, I add a second layer of down. Now, the Army came up with another system in 1944. Or was almost too late to be used in the war. Most of the war wasn't used, uh, but it's one that that affects affected me personally. Let me show it to you. It looks like this. This is the 1944 sleeping bag. Now, some people incorrectly. I think that this is used as a liner. This was designed as a liner for the mountain bag, and, and, and that's not true. This was designed strictly for the infantry to be used in the place of a regular blanket. It comes with a waterproof cover, and let me open this up so I can use my hands. It comes with a waterproof cover, and the Army says that if you use it with the waterproof cover, uh, it is as good as two four-pound wool blankets. And I can tell you it is. Uh, I can also say, without equivocation, without fear of anybody telling me I am wrong or making something up, that this sleeping bag was the favorite sleeping bag of adolescents and young teenagers in southern New Hampshire in the late 1960s. Ask me how I know. I still use this thing as a winter bag uh, if I'm going camping in a tent in Texas in winter. Uh, this will get me down to 40 degrees, okay? That's not bad. It doesn't weigh a whole lot, uh, and it doesn't take up a whole lot of bulk. There were a kajillion of these made, uh, but they never made it overseas. The war ended in August of 1945. In Europe it ended in May. And this is the 1944 bag, which means it really didn't get into service until late 1944. Some of them were used in Europe. Of course, they weren't issued in the Pacific at all because, you know, like jungles. Uh, and they were retained for the, uh, and used in the Korean War. But lots of these went out of uh, surplus. And that brings us to the principle. Again, uh, the principal contribution to camping sleeping bags in the, in the Second World War was not necessarily the design. The mummy bag uh, had been around since 1928, like I showed you. Uh, the problem with that was is, is that, number one, they were marketed mainly in Canada, and they were used mainly by mountaineers, those in the, in the upper tier of the United States, uh, upper tier of states in the United States. Uh, so it hadn't, they hadn't percolated down into the general backpacking slash camping communities. Uh, but the production, the numbers, of sleeping bags made by the Army was prodigious. If you're going to produce uh, sleeping bags for the 10th Mountain Division, about 20,000 guys, you don't just make 20,000 sleeping bags. You make at least enough for each one of them to have a replacement due to loss or damage. And the Army realized how good this sleeping bag was, and they started making enough for use by troops in Alaska and Mongolia. We had troops in Mongolia and in other mountainous terrain. Okay, They didn't make quite as many of the Arctic bags because those were relegated for use by the Air Corps in the Arctic that, that, for airplanes that were expected to fly in high mountain and Arctic environments. Okay. But what happened was, after World War II, is suddenly the general camping population, the general backpacking community, were exposed to inexpensive and durable goose-down mummy sleeping bags. And even though they weren't expensive, 
They were much in demand. You could go further in a lighter load using one of those army sleeping bags than you could with anything made by Tepatco or Hirschweiss or Luber. Now, I'm going to see if I can get out of this uh, without falling down like a, do like, a, like a bowling pin. But in the meantime, we'll see you down the trail.